Hi, I'm Eric Reinecke, and I'm here with uh, Mangala. Hi. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the, what we do with edit timelines and how we efficiently stream the data over uh, the internet based on edit timeline information. So first, we're going to talk about, uh, in part one, Mangala is going to talk about a trailer production workflow that she created. And then in part two, I'm going to talk a little more broadly about edit intelligence in media pipelines and uh, talk a little about a project I've had the pleasure of working on called Open Timeline IO. So I will hand it over. Um, so uh, today we are going to talk about mostly how do we do trailers at Netflix and um, the evolution that happened in the process, uh, how EDLs played a big role in this evolution, and we will end with Eric talking about Open Timeline IO and how we can further enhance this uh, solution. So uh, I work with the compute, the CSI team. I like to call it CSI because it sounds cool. Uh, CSI Los Gatos. Um, but compute and storage infrastructure is boring, but um, I will do for today. Uh, so what do we do there in CSI? Um, we don't nab criminals, but we are interested in managing the cloud infrastructure for media processing. What this means is uh, we have our um, cloud instances in a farm and a bunch of them provisioned so we can run every media that comes into our system, make it viewable so any of those devices that you use, all of those have gone through our encoding farms. And um, let's say you are a video engineer and you have a new codec or maybe even a new algorithm that you want to test. You're working on it and now it's time, I want to test this out. Uh, but you don't want to be bogged down by, okay, how do I get these instances provisioned? You don't want to worry about how do I get to that storage uh, that's in the cloud. And that's what we do with these encoding farms. We have all that sorted out and you get an opportunity to test out your new algorithm or your new codec. Uh, in addition to this, we have been working on um, increasing the efficiency of our cloud compute. Uh, this is mainly, you know Netflix is making a lot of originals and this catalog keeps growing. Um, but our compute is still the same. We want to be efficient. Uh, I, there is like thousands of hours um, of uh, compute available, but we saturate that as well. And now it's time uh, to use that idle uh, CPU hours during our off-peak streaming hours, and that's what the efficiency part is about. We also do um, storage of media in the cloud, and it has to be secure. We have an abstraction on top of S3 that makes sure that the data is encrypted. So let's say um, S3 is secure, but uh, there was uh, some kind of uh, hacker who got in and got to our data. It's not useful to them because it's already encrypted. It's meaningless. Those bytes are useless to them. So that way we ensure that the storage is secure. And um, we, now that we have the storage in the cloud, how do we make them available to our uh, studio partners and um, to the cloud compute farms, and even artists who might be anywhere in the world. We want to efficiently transfer these bytes irrespective of the geographic distance. So our work is also on efficient transfers. Maybe someday we can have Victor here, who's part of the CSI team, come and talk about that. So this slide is trying to demonstrate or make a point about how we are different than a traditional studio. In a traditional studio, we have a bunch of artists. They are in a location, uh, and the storage is in the premises. So everything is co-located. <clears throat> now coming to Netflix studio, we have artists anywhere in the world. They don't necessarily stay together, and the storage is in the cloud. <clears throat> storage being in the cloud is extremely efficient for our compute, which is also in the cloud. But with these artists, we have to get the, this data down to these different locations, and that's where the challenge lies. Uh, 
with that in mind, with data getting down to these artists, we'll begin our a quick overview, a very high level overview of how the trailer creation process used to look like. So a creative guy who is in maybe somewhere in the world needs to download the proxy version of that video that was just shot somewhere. And um, the reason that they are using the proxy version and not the full quality, the high quality video is it takes a long time to download a lot of data. And it's really hard to work with a full quality video in the application like Adobe Premiere. It, the experience is extremely sluggish. And also there is that requirement for disk space on their workstation. That makes it working with proxy easier. And this is general, the, high, like the metadata about that proxy video that they are downloading. It's anywhere in the hundreds of megabyte range. Um, a trailer can be generated for episodic content. Typically, Netflix has about 13 episodes. You might end up having to download each of those episodes because they have to watch. It's a creative process. And the download time is approximately five minutes, anywhere from like a couple of minutes. That's fine. We move to the edit part of, it, of the creative part, where the artist is actually going to work on this proxy file, make creative decisions by looking at each of the episodes, figuring out which part of this video is useful and will make into the trailer. This process is extremely long. Like you can see, it's 12 days, because it goes through a first draft then several uh, rounds of edits, revisions, and uh, reviews. And even the producer has to approve this. By the time they are done with all this, we have a copy, which is called the final locked copy. That means there are no more edits allowed. And it, we move on to the next part, which is another creative step called sound mixing. We add audio effects to the trailer. You hear that nice Netflix ding sound and maybe um, some audio effects that might be taken from a separate video. So there's a lot of more creative work involved. Once we have the audio and the sound, um, the audio and the video married together, we get a proxy trailer. So everything about this trailer is perfect except it's proxy. That means we can't stream it on our devices. It's watermarked. Move on to the actual process of getting a full quality video, which involves downloading the full length video, which is high quality. And this is uh, another person who is going to work on this, is the assistant editor in this step. And uh, here you can see that it's um, a lot of data, anywhere from tens of gigabytes to a terabyte with Again, the same number of episodes that were used for the original trailer creation process. And the download time is about 10 hours. Can range from a couple of hours to 10 hours, depending upon how much content is getting downloaded. Once they have that down on their disk, they begin the conform process, where they replace, they offline that proxy trailer that was generated, and replace it with the full, full high quality version. This process takes and about an hour. So there's still some creative uh, work going on because there, there can be some QC, maybe adding a few extra seconds from the full quality video, maybe taking off some. In the end, they export this high quality trailer from Adobe Premiere. That's pretty much the entire trailer generation process. And the question was, how can we make this efficient? Yes, you just mentioned that uh, Adobe is good in uh, low quality videos, but here we are seeing the same product, but you are mentioning that it is also good for high quality videos? Uh, good question. So when we are using the proxy video, it's mostly a lot of creative work. There's a lot of editing going on. But in the last step where we are replacing it, we are just offlining, offlining it. We are not actually scrubbing through the, the full quality video. So sluggishness is not a problem at this step. So at the end, we have this whole um, process. It looks very time consuming. Uh, we were thinking about what can be improved here. 
The first longest process here is the, the 12 plus days of uh, creative process, but there's nothing we can do much about it. It is work that needs to be done by the creative folks. The second longest process that we observe is that long download time, which could be uh, in hours. Um, okay, so do we really need every single bit of that, the full length high quality video? Because in the trailer, it's a three minute trailer and we are downloading hours of content here. So the question is, do we really need that terabyte worth of data? Because in the end, the trailer will be of like tens of gigabytes. So the question is, how do we know what we want? Somebody made this decision to generate a trailer by looking at the timelines and telling, OK, from this content, get me a few seconds. And then from the next episode, give me a minute. And how can we get that creative decision automated. That's our first problem. And the second problem is even though if we manage to get the relevant bytes down, how do we make it appear as a full length video so that Adobe can conform, Adobe Premiere can do the conform process. Let's try to figure out the first problem. So an artist made some creative decisions. How do we export it out? Luckily, Adobe Premiere has a feature to get this edit list out into a format which is human readable. There's a question. Yeah, um, who's, who's in charge of the creative process here? Like in, in this um, inception of the artist or in Netflix? The artist is. And they are they could be contractors which we um, engage with and they could be anywhere in the world. Can you repeat the question from the very end? OK, yeah. I like the questions, they are awesome, but uh, let's keep it at the end. <laughs> All right, so we have now an EDL file, and we'll look at how an EDL file looks. EDL file is the edit decision list, and it has every single timeline that was uh, used by the creative folk to figure out which timeline from a source was used uh, for the trailer creation. And you can see that there are two boxes here. One talks about the input time codes. These are time codes from that original full length source that we downloaded in proxy format. And then oh, how do these map out to our actual uh, trailer? So there's an input timeline and there's an output timeline. We are interested in the input timeline because this tells us what are those time ranges that are interesting to us and what do we actually need to download. So it's interesting, uh, we've solved uh, half of the problem because we know now what are the timelines that we want to download. But when our uh, object, our full length source is an S3, we need to talk in terms of bytes. So the next problem uh, to solve is how to map these timelines into bytes. So just a little history about how media makes uh, a, a new somebody film something out and we have a source now sitting in S3. But when it comes to our system, we inspect it. We figure out, is the source really valid? Are there issues with it? This process is called inspection. And during this inspection process, we collect a lot of metadata about that media file. Uh, things like, uh, what is the runtime? How, how big is that file? How many, in terms of bytes? Um, what is the FPS? And FPS in particular will help us map these timelines into frames. So we again came to the second half of the problem. How do we map the frames into byte ranges? And uh, this can be solved by using an index file, which was again uh, generated by the inspection process. And this index file is basically a mapping of what are the frames in this file and what is the byte offset. So it helps us to map now frames to bytes. So with a little math, we figured out how we can get to byte ranges starting from timelines. And here is a pictorial representation of that same sound bites I was doing. Uh, we have a really long movie, and there is uh, sections within this movie that made it to the trailer. So anything between the red lines are the interesting stuff for us. 
and then everything outside those um, red boxes are non-interesting bytes. So we really don't care. And we were downloading all of this bytes. We also need a little extra because every media file has some header info, metadata information that every single player needs to understand what this media is about, where are those frames actually, and how can we read and play it in any of the players. So we'll pull that in. So as you can see, really long media, and we want some sections, some bytes out of it. Now that we have answered what we need, the question is how do we do it and how do we make it appear as if it was a full length video so we can trick Adobe Premiere into believing that we gave it a full length video. The tricksters. And that's our solution. We have developed a tool called Mesafest. Uh, we did have a blog post maybe a couple of weeks ago, so if you're interested, uh, hop on to Netflix's tech blog. You can read uh, this amazing product, and if there is a lot of interest, maybe we can collaborate and work on an open source tool. Uh, if there is a lot of interest, we can look into that. Uh, some of the features that are relevant to our trailer generation, uh, this is not by any means all the other cool stuff that Mesafest can do. The first thing is it can mount objects as local files, which means as an artist, I really don't care where those bytes are coming from. So once I mount it using Mesafest, it appears to the artist as if those files are on my local disk. And behind the scene, Mesafest is actually streaming those bytes from our cloud storage, which in our case is S3. There is also this feature in Mesafest that lets you cache those stream bytes on the, your desktop. So let's say I, as an artist, decided to take a break. I closed my laptop, walked away, and I come back and I can resume from where I started off. So it would know that you downloaded so many bytes from that source, and now I'll continue from the point where it was paused. We also uh, allow streaming objects from an streaming an S3 object from a certain byte offset. This is especially useful for our use case because we are not start trying to stream from zero to the last bit in the media file. So I can say, give me start from byte offset 100 and up to a certain range. Um, the last part is, which is the interesting part, is we can tell MesaFS, given a S3 object, there are certain bytes that are interesting, and the rest is non-interesting. So we can say, get the interesting bytes from S3, and then fake the other ones. This is what is tricking Adobe Premiere. And here is a pictorial representation of how MesaFest works. MesaFest is a Python library that we download onto the user's workstation. And it has a handle on the cloud storage. So when Adobe Premiere tries to stream certain bytes from that file that we just mounted, in the background, Mesafest is pulling them down from S3, caching it locally, and Adobe Premiere is able to render those bytes. But let's say Adobe Premiere asked for something which is not part of our trailer. It's not interesting to us. So as you can see, Mesafest does not stream those bytes from S3. So we are saving on download time here and it's instead giving it a set of zeros that somehow render into Adobe Premiere as a red frames, irrelevant stuff for us. So this was our original process with trailer generation. But the, this process changes a bit. We introduced something called the EDL file. So when the artist generates that proxy trailer, we said, he, give us the EDL file as well and we'll use it in the confirm process. But we also said we do not want the full length high quality video. We are just downloading the trailer length video. And that means we are saving on download times. So instead of hours, now it's in the order of minutes. And the disk space requirements changes from terabytes to tens of gigabytes. So we were trying to capture how does this model help us uh, save on time. So the original model was example, Norm MacDonald is an episodic content on our Netflix service. It used to take about two hours, 40 minutes to download the full length video versus now it takes about four minutes. And you can see the difference in uh, bytes that you are downloading. And uh, just to extrapolate that, 
we, do, we have a trailer generated with 11 episodes, almost a terabyte of data, but we reduced it down to about 18 minutes from ours. And to wrap this all, what were the benefits that we got out of this approach? We reduced the download times. We saw that we came down to orders of minutes. We do not have this requirement for, um, there's basically our disk footprint has d gone down significantly. The local disk. Yes. And there is a security advantage. So at no point was the entire full length video on the user's desktop. So that much less chances, chances of getting media lost somewhere in the wrong hands. And we have given the opportunity for our creative folks to focus more on the creative work and not getting bogged down by this whole download time and uh, even the disk space requirements. Okay, they can spend more cycles on the creative work. With that, uh, handing over to Eric, who's going to be talking about Open Timeline and how we can further enhance this feature. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Eric Reinecke. I'm a v an engineer on the encoding team at Netflix. And so I want to talk a little about what encoding team does. Um, so uh, one of the things we do is deal with implementing video encoding at scale. Uh, Mangala's team provides us with the compute infrastructure, and we write the things that run within that compute infrastructure. Uh, our team also generate, uh, is responsible for the VMAF perceptual quality uh, analysis uh, system. So that's a way of rather than looking at how the computer sees differences in different representations of video, using a perceptual scale to see what the effect on a human looking at it would be. Uh, we also spearhead the development of new codecs. Uh, there are people on our team currently working on the AV1 codec that we'll be rolling out, and number of audio codecs as well. Um, we do media asset analysis and title metadata management, so this can be looking at actual frames and finding uh, interesting objects within those using machine learning networks. It also involves you know, just the actual looking at media files and figuring out how the data is laid out inside them and you know, some of those more nutsy boltsy things. Um, and then finally, we do a lot of workflow tools for the asset creation pipeline. So this includes encoding services and uh, some of the more edit-related things that we're starting to look at now have, are falling under our domain. Uh, and that's the area I work in for the most part. Uh, advance. There we go. So I love editorial. It is. The part of the process that I've worked in for most of my time in the industry. Um, and there's a concept that's always talked about in the industry that's known as the three rewrites. Um, a movie is written first when it's commit to the pages of the screenplay. It gets written a second time when the director and the actors interpret it in front of the camera and it's commit to film. But the final place, the place where it all comes together, is in editorial. This is the first time you get to see the movie in its full extent and with timing and pacing and music. This is where the emotion all comes together. Uh, and you know, a movie can be completely recreated in this room. And this is what ends up on, on film. So a lot of what I believe in is the fact that by creating efficiency in this point in the pipeline, and letting that echo back through the entire process, uh, we can create more time for the filmmakers to focus on things that are going to impact making a better story. So today, what we're going to talk about, or what I'm going to talk about in part two here, is uh, what I mean when I talk about timeline and where pipelines. Mangala gave you the very early preview of that. Um, and then uh, some of the ways that uh, edit information has moved through these pipelines in the past. And then I'm going to talk about this thing called Open Timeline I.O. and how it's uh, enabling the next step in being able to push edit-aware pipelines. OK, so if you're a filmmaker, you want to ask yourself, what would my movie look like if I delivered it right now 
At any given moment, you want to know what's my movie look like and where should I be focusing my attention to push that movie forward as much as possible. So, you know, at the pitch stage, that's pretty easy. You've got your one line elevator pitch and that's just what it is. And, you know, at the other end, you've got this great tile in Netflix that you can tap on and you get your dunk and you can watch the movie, right? But how do you get information about this in between spot? That's, that's what I think edits can feed. Um, if you think about the filmmaking process, it's very much about a million people with a million different questions all the time that they're trying to get answered. And if you don't have the right answers to that, you're not going to be effective in making the movie better, right? So I think the EDL in a lot of ways can be sort of this set of tea leaves where a bunch of the answers to this stuff is encoded. If you just know how to look, find the tea leaves and how to interpret them. So there's another piece which Mangala talked about a lot and she demonstrated really effectively. Um, what are the interesting bites? The edit is, is something that's going to tell you um, where, what of the movies used. So if you think about um, you know, current digital workflows, we're seeing shows that are shooting four, seven terabytes a day worth of dailies. And if you consider that they might have five, 10, 50, 100 to one shoot ratios on those shows, that means of that seven terabytes, maybe 160 gigabytes of that are actually interesting every day. So that 15 hours on a gigabit ethernet connection it takes to move that seven terabytes, really all you care about is this 22 minutes of that, right? And again, that's what Mangala showed us in the, in the numbers. Um, so all I gotta do is get an EDL and then I've got all this stuff unlocked for me, right? How, how do we go about getting an EDL? Well, there's number one, the CMX EDL, which I think is probably the most ubiquitous format for EDLs. Uh, most people have encountered them at some point. Uh, it originated with CMX systems. This is uh, from the 1971 NAB demo of the CMX 600 online editing system, uh, wherein you could generate an offline EDL, write it to paper tape as a CMX EDL, feed it to a teletype machine and online it on the CMX 200 tape machine. Um, it evolved a little bit and we got the CMX 3600. You know, 1971 was a different time. Uh, the edits had, these, these EDLs proved really powerful in these early workflows. Um, and actually the CMX published a paper with the standard for these EDELs in 1988 is the earliest version of it I could find. And then I think it's 1993, SMPTE SIMPTI actually standardized uh, a segment of that document in SMPTE 258M. So I have a question in this room with film technology people who's implemented a CMX parser. Yeah, there's a few CMX parsers out there. Um, I don't think you did a good enough job because I'm pretty sure, did you implement these instructions from the CMX EDL? Uh, so there's wait, which literally stops the assembly of the edit in the middle so an operator can do something about it. And then uh, there's bell, which will play a little noise on the device. Um, so I think we, sh we need to go update our CMX parsers to actually be able to do these things. Um, I think the point is, is that when you look at CMX EDLs, there's sort of two factors about them. One, they were made to be you know, somewhat human interpretable and readable because there's an operator there where something's gonna go wrong in this tape robot and they're gonna have to intervene and address it or at least you know, pause and bell so they know when to switch the tapes out in the tape machine. Um, and then two, it really kind of boils down to being this instruction set for how do you create a finalized edit at the end of the process, right? So this is something that's more of like an end output. It's made for A roll, B roll editing. The problem is, is that, you know, what we want to do is we want to get our edit information much earlier. We want to be seeing the editor and director's decisions 
earlier in the process. So what do those multi-track EDLs with maybe a little more complexity look like? Because CMX isn't great for those. Um, so, oh, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. This, is, uh, this just talks about what those CMX EDLs look like. Mangala covered this mostly. You have your source tape time, your destination tape time. It's just copying things. So what I really want to do is introduce you to my very favorite new hashtag on Twitter, Timeline Tuesday, uh, wherein editors post their edit timelines. So this is more realistic about what editors' timelines look like. There it is blown up. It's not going to help you at all because it's very complex. Complex. Um, so the question is, is, how do we get something with a little more richness? All right, we have a new EDL option, 8AF, right? So this is created by the AAF Foundation. What AAF actually is, is it's a container format for moving media assets around and metadata along with those. Uh, early on, it didn't have a strong opinion about how exactly that data was structured. The edit protocol was introduced to create a little more standardization around that. Please help me with the details on this, because my AAF knowledge is a little, a, a little iffy. Um, and uh, Avid has adapted this as this interchange format of choice. Um, and you know, it is a good, strong, powerful object model in binary form that you can move around. You know, the problem is, is that there are complexities associated with AAF. So this, this is stolen from the AAF document. And you know, there's stuff here, and you can kind of come to understand this chart. But this isn't how we think about our editorial timelines. We, don't, we think of them as being these tracks that are laid out linearly, and you have transitions laid in. This, this uh, defines a great structure for machines to read, but it's not so human friendly. And actually, I wanted to do a dump of the mobs from an AAF file for this presentation to put up on a slide. But I sort of gave up trying to build the AAF toolkit because it's just not the easiest C++ thing to build. And ultimately, if you have people like assistant editors that want to hack out Python scripts to help them with edit intelligence, this is something that's going to be a barrier to entry for them. So what else can we look to? Final Cut Pro XML. This is great because this is an inspectable format. Uh, Final Apple created it for Final Cut. They actually first published their XML document in, I think it was about 2003 with Final Cut 4 or something like that, somewhere around that area. Um, and you know, it's a pretty decent format. It expresses things as we think about them. Um, it's pretty clear. It's, and here's a little bit of Final Cut XML. I've I've sort of thinned it out a little bit here just to get the, the broad idea. But you know, there's this dissolve test to sequence, and it's got a track, and it's got these clips in it. You have in and out points. You can even put transitions in the middle. That's pretty cool. This actually seems like a good option. Well, it has issues too. If we go back to the last slide, one of the big issues is going from here to here that format changed pretty drastically. And so what it's done is it's left the Final Cut XML support landscape in products um, a little bit scattered at times. And ultimately, there's another problem that you, it's, there's not really a clear path for embedding arbitrary metadata in there. Final Cut 10 XML may be a little better about that. Final Cut 7 XML, not so open to that. So you have this whole landscape of sort of all these different tools we're using. This is just a small subset of them. And they all speak slightly different dialects of the same formats, or they don't speak the same formats. Um, and so you think to yourself, OK, what can we do to solve this? Uh, enter Open Timeline I.O. So what's Open Timeline I.O.? Open Timeline I.O. is an open source API and interchange format for editorial timeline information. And as I said earlier in the presentation, for full disclosure, I'm one of the contributors to this project. So please take everything I say with a grain of salt and trust only your own uh, experience with this. But I've had a good experience. <laughs> um, so 
what is open timeline IO? I like to describe it in sort of three primary points. There's an API that defines an editorial data model and a lot of utilities for being able to manipulate, traverse, inspect, query that data model. Um, additionally, it's an interchange format that lets you serialize that data model, move it around between applications. Um, and then finally, it's a collection of these adapters that let you import from other formats into the Open Timeline data, IO data model and export out of that Open Timeline IO data model. So now you're saying this. Eric, you just showed me three other formats. This is number four. Uh, I stole this slide from Stefan, who's here. He did an F FMX presentation of Open Timeline IO. He's one of the core maintainers of it. Um, so the question is, is why is Open Timeline IO different, and why is it going to evade this problem, hopefully? Um, well, one thing you can think about is that there's sort of a continuum of timeline complexity. This is yet another slide stolen from Stefan. Um, you can think of this left side, you have the EDL, which is a you know, text-only printer. And then you can think of the other end of this, which is this sort of all-in copy machine that, you know, PC load letter, what does that mean, kind of action. And what OTIO is trying to do is it wants to live right here in this happy, just right Goldilocks zone for EDLs. Um, and you know, I think that's powerful, but there's another piece. If we go back to this slide, um, there's, I think there's a lot of focus on this part of Open Timeline I.O., of it being another interchange format. And to me, that is something that is incredibly useful in my pipelines, because I have a way to serialize these timelines really conveniently. However, I think actually the really important part that people should first pay attention to is that it has an API with, that allows you to manipulate the data model, and it has a collection of imp, uh, adapters to import and export from that data model. So what that means is it, it's able to work as a bit of a Rosetta Stone for all these things, and unlike all the other interchange formats, it actually gives you ways to do the complex time math, which I don't know if any of you have had to try and evaluate through a timeline hierarchy and deal with the transforms of time, Stefan has. Um, <laughs> it's not easy. So having a library to be able to help you with that stuff is non-trivial. And you know, that interchange format is something that is, in some ways, almost just a useful aside. I don't want to discount it like that, though. So the stats on it. Uh, Pixar hosts the open source development of this project, and uh, it's entirely driven focusing on real-world use cases. Um, it contains contributions from many, many studios th throughout the, ven the uh, industry. Also, vendors have been contributing to it. Uh, it's been in development since 2016. Is that correct? 2016? Okay. Uh, and uh, we just released public beta 10 two days ago. Um, and currently has a Python API. If you go to the GitHub, there's actually a branch right now where a C++ API lives, and that's uh, in preview to be able to check out. And uh, there's adapters for AF, EDL, XML. There's actually a few other crazy community ones out there. There's HLS, a few other strange things. Um, and then, actually, adapters can be provided by the plugin system. So if you like, you can write an adapter, put it in uh, PyPy, publish it, and anyone can install it. And Open Timeline IO will find it and give them the ability to work with it. So what's this data model look like? You have, this is from Open Timeline IO's documentation. On the top, you have a timeline. It has tracks, which is a stack of tracks. Um, and then each track has a list of clips. And in between, within that list of clips, you can put transitions. And each clip points to a media reference. So when you're interfacing with the Python object model, this is the level at which you're interacting with it. This is the way we think about things 
uh, when we're talking about timelines. You go in Premiere, you go in Avid. The timeline looks roughly like this. Um, so here's what the, uh, tr the interchange format looks like. It's all JSON-based. It's very inspectable. Uh, I selected a clip from here, but most OTIO objects look a fair bit like this, just a few different fields. Um, you'll notice that we have uh, time here. This is, a, this is a time range. Time is reflected as uh, time fractions, where there is a rate. And in this case, we're using the frame rate of the content. And then there's a value, which in this case, if your denominator is your frame rate, your numerator will be your frame number. Um, and if we dive into what a media reference looks like, you'll notice they have a name and a target URL, which that's something you need to know what the thing is and where to find it on disk. But uh, I think a more interesting part is that every open timeline I IO object allows for arbitrary nested uh, data in uh, JSON format. So we could use a Netflix namespace here and then record database IDs for these very things. So rather than parsing out our URL string there to try and figure out what a unique identifier is, we can just explicitly state it in our media references. Uh, so, oh, jumped ahead of me here. What does it look like in code? This is some OTIO Python code. What I did is I just took a quick crack at implementing a small segment of the logic that Mangala's EDL stuff does. And so the first thing we do is we can just read in a da uh, an EDL from OTIO with a simple read from file. Um, advance. OK, here we go. Uh, you can iterate through just the video tracks in the timeline. And then in each uh, video track, you can iterate through the clips. Here we go, and we just fetch the, uh, the Netflix metadata from the, the media reference. And then finally, we can go here and grab the ranges. So at the end of the day, this will create a mapping of what asset ID it is to exactly what time ranges are used within it. And if you want to get even weirder here, um, OTIO has a really rich data mo or a really rich API for being able to do math with time, as I described before. So what this will do is take all those ranges because some of them may overlap with each other as they were used in different parts of the timeline. This will take them and combine them together. So you can go and say, all right, order the ranges by when they started, and then iterate through each of them. And if uh, this one overlaps the previous one, just combine it with the previous one and go to the next one and see if that one overlaps. Otherwise, just add it to the list and start accumulating the next range. But you'll notice that doing this kind of comparison is just as simple as, does this range overlap the other range? You're not doing, is, this, is the end frame less than or equal to the start frame of the? It takes care of that, which is math. I think anyone who's dealt with timelines before has written too many times in their life. Uh, OK, and finally, one of the things it comes with is this viewer application. So anything that uh, Open Timeline IO can open, you can pop up in this viewer. And uh, you can see the metadata and how it renders out into these different objects. Uh, this is really useful for both debugging timelines you get from who knows what editor, who in our case often is across an ocean. And it's hard to get communication cycles with them. I don't have a Media Composer license at my desk. So this is nice for me to be able to view AAFs. Um, and also, it's useful for debugging your code. Um, so if you're interested, there's, this is developed in the open on GitHub. And there's also a Google group where we talk about it. Um, I, I think it's worth picking up and adopting. Uh, this is public beta software, so you might hit some issues. When you hit issues, get engaged. It's a really great community. There's a, a lot of people from, uh, the op from uh, studios, is, especially in visual effects and animation. And we're starting to see a lot more of the vendors start to show up in there, too. Um, so we're really excited about this at Netflix. And we're happy to be starting to 
push contributions back and start to use it in our pipelines, I think you should go check it out at this URL. Um, additionally, I'm a Python person, so I just like to pip install open timeline IO. It's often the first thing I do. Uh, finally, I want to thank Josh Miner at Pixar and Stefan Steinbach. They've been great hosts to this community, and they've created a, a place where uh, we can all collaborate and create this great uh, timeline tool set for people to use. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>